All right, so uh, what do we mean by osteocoronary lesions? Essentially, we're talking about a either aorta osteal or branched osteal lesions. Osteal left main, right vein graft. And the principles that uh, we learn from dealing with these lesions, we can apply to renals, uh, subclavians, other peripheral vessels. In branched osteals, really the osteal uh, left circumflex or LAD really falls under the scope of bifurcation stenting, a lot of which you've already seen today. The outcome challenges with osteal lesions are real and they persist even in the DES era with lower procedural success rates, higher complication rates, uh, increased TLR, and obviously if you miss the osteum, which is the key here, you're going to have higher TLR rates. And uh, not that much debate today where we really think drug eluting stents, uh, the data is uh, better than bare metal stents. And I put innovation here in quotes because there's a lot of back to basics here, things that we teach our fellows uh, that sometimes we forget when we're in a rush. But uh, I'm just going to run through this quickly. Guide selection, very important. Uh, coaxial guide engagement. This whole issue of side holes and pressure dampening, I think we have to uh, really understand that uh, we can't trust side hole pressures always. It can give us a false reassurance. Lesion preparation is key, particularly for osteolesions, lesions, where uh, I favor rotational atherectomy. And uh, you can have problems with uh, orbital atherectomy and then osteal uh, you know, left main or osteal RCA, uh, you can use a technique where you uh, advance your crown in and burr on the way back, but you want to be careful with that aorta osteal junction. The most common mistake I see is people don't define the osteum, so appropriate angiographic angles, understanding how to lay out the aorta osteal junction, and then that plays into landing your stent, ideally hanging it out a few millimeters. Obviously, you don't want to hang it out quite a bit because then you can never really re-engage the vessel and it's a, a nightmare. Uh, also, there have been reports when people use short stents, eight millimeter stents to try to nail the osteum that it can disappear later and it can embolize out. Uh, so uh, you want to be careful with too short of a stent. And then I think the use of imaging, uh, particularly IVIS, is very important just to reassure yourself that you've hit the osteum and you've expanded it appropriately, and then flaring it is uh, very important. Uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, the Osteal Pro? Have you used it? Is it routine in your practice? So not that much. The idea here is that this is a device with these pronged arms. It really helps define the aorta osteal junction and allows you to precisely place your stent uh, at the aorta osteal uh, position not really uh, taken up very uh, much by the community, but uh, it can be helpful. So I'm gonna show you a couple of cases. The first one is where nailing the osteum is key, and if you don't, you're really in trouble. This is a male with uh, angina, occluded RCA with uh, LAD septal collaterals, and uh, you, know, you can see that the RCA CTO involves the very proximal part of the uh, vessel in involving the osteum. Uh, reverse card is uh, attempted, but uh, unsuccessful uh, re-entry back into the uh, true lumen. We switched to an anagrade uh, dissection re-entry with a stingray catheter and able to penetrate into the true lumen distally, so we're feeling pretty good. Uh, proceed with the full metal jacket. Uh, we're pretty confident we got the ostium, we post-dilated. But did we really nail it? Here's our picture and you can see that there's now a dissection of the aortic cusp there of the right coronary cusp. We pull back, take a shot. We still feel like, hey, we've nailed this osteum. We're not confident that we need to put another stent in. But of course, the patient develops severe uh, chest pain radiating into the back. And shortly thereafter, CT reveals extensive aortic dissection requiring surgical repair. So this is the consequences of underestimating where the osteum is and not nailing the osteum with a stent. So uh, again, IVIS in this case is helpful. Uh, you think you have stent of the osteum, you see struts, but you have to really look at that aorta osteal junction and you want to see stent struts uh, hanging out in that uh, osteum. Another case that's uh, very painful, a 77-year-old female referred to me for a TAVR after PCI of her right by her primary cardiologist. This is the original image. You can see the heavy calcium and the tight osteal lesion. Uh, a stent's position, in, in retrospect, when we go back and look at all the films, you see that it's sort of a shallow LAO uh, projection, so the osteum's really unclear. Where, where is the osteum here? 
Uh, it's dilated, here's the stent uh, deployed, and either the ostium is missed or underexpanded. Regardless, uh, the IVIS is done and it confirmed that uh, there was no st st stent struts in the aortosteal junction and there was actually uh, persistent lesion there in the proximal vessel. So an eight millimeter stent is then positioned at the ostium, which is obviously always suboptimal to have overlap there. Um, it's expanded, doesn't quite fully expand, and you're left with essentially an underexpanded stent sticking out. Uh, at least it looks like the ostium has been uh, treated this time. So she's now uh, ready for her TAVR. Uh, we look at the right coronary artery stent, it's sticking out, which um, you know is a little concerning. Uh, but at least the coronary height looks uh, adequate. She does have a faced sinuses, so in this case, I decide that we, we should protect this right coronary uh, stent. And uh, we get access from the radial approach to protect the RCA. It's really even difficult to wire this uh, stented right. Able to get a wire down, difficult to advance a balloon, post dilated aggressively. Thought about putting another stent, but you know, unable to even deliver a stent at that point. Probably in, in hindsight, it's better not to add more metal to this uh, mix there. Uh, so uh, eventually, after about an hour of doing all this, we get a non-compliant balloon down the right coronary artery, and that's gonna be our protection balloon that uh, we can pull back and post-dilate this stent if it gets uh, kinked or crimped by the uh, TAVR strut. So this is a 23 millimeter S3. It's deployed. Unfortunately, in this case, you know, we still have patency of uh, the right coronary artery. I know everybody wanted to see it like occluded or gone, but uh, it's, it's patent and it had flow, but you know, it was, it was quite concerning when we were planning out this case. We had to post dilate it. A lot of thought went into managing this underexpanded right coronary. So um, osteo lesion preparation, we've heard a little bit about it. Uh, I use rotational atherectomy for that. I think in the case I just showed, if you know, debulking that osteal right, getting that calcium uh, treated first would have allowed better stent uh, uh, apposition and expansion. So uh, generally the technique, as, as most of you are familiar with, is to hang your guide out into the aorta, try to be as coaxial, and then start running the burr in the aorta as you peck into the uh, proximal right coronary artery. So uh, making sure the ostium dilated is key, uh, flaring it. Uh, this is the flash osteal system. Has anybody used the flash osteal here? So again, sort of specialty products that, have, that haven't really uh, gotten widespread adoption. This is for when a stent's already uh, deployed. Uh, the idea is use a very soft uh, compliant balloon and you inflate it and it really uh, dilates up that ostium and flares it out and uh, aligns it with the aorta osteal wall. That's what it looks like when it's inflated. Um, again, a, somewhat of a specialty product. So the reality is do we re need to get fancy and uh, you know, in short, I think it's back to basics. So really identifying the ostium prepping the lesion, nailing the ostium, and then flaring and post in the stent. I think these accessory devices are interesting. Uh, I haven't incorporated them in my routine practice at all, uh, but I try to emphasize, especially with my fellows, the, the basics. Thank you. I don't know if there's any comments from the audience. Uh, um, one question, and then I think we're in, we're in time to finish the session. So do you see any role for cutting balloons or uh, angiosculpts uh, in osteal lesions? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, particularly for fibrotic lesions, uh, I find the cutting balloons to be helpful. I, I didn't really go into it here. Uh, it can be hard to deliver them and, and position them. There's uh, the new Wolverine balloon from Boston that's uh, a lot more deliverable. That's quite helpful. Uh, I think as an adjunct to uh, atherectomy, rotational atherectomy, or even an orbital, uh, following that up with a cutting balloon is, is helpful uh, as well. Yes.